Hello and welcome to episode 39 of Wally Gisnep's Animated Classics, the podcast dedicated to revisiting each and every one of the so-called Walt Disney Animated Classics in chronological order. We are here to review them on their own merits, putting aside historical context and nostalgia, and trying to break down which of these films are truly worthy of being called a classic. My name's Ben and joining me as always is my good friend Liam. Liam, what are we looking at this week? Today, Ben, we are taking a look at the passion project from one of our favourite directorial duos. We are looking at Musker and Clements' Treasure Planet, the 2002 loose adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Now, cards on the table here, Ben. Treasure Island is one of my favourite stories possibly ever, and Musker and Clements are one of my favourite directorial duos possibly ever so presumably this is one of your favorite films ever and we can just end the podcast there and then you'd think wouldn't you (laughs) (laughs) well i'm gonna also put my cards on the table over the top of your cards because i don't really care for the story of treasure island very much maybe that's because i've seen and read so many versions of it or maybe i just don't care much for pirates well on top of that this is also part of a genre that teenage liam was all about which is space pirates There's something about it that just really excites me. There's a weird, grindy RPG released at the end of the PS2 life cycle called Rogue Galaxy, and it's one of my favourite JRPGs, and I think it's only because it's Space Pirates. What I'm saying is, I am a very easy man to please when it comes to Space Pirates. Just keep that in mind when we talk about this film. It's interesting you mention video games, because... I feel in some ways this almost feels more like a video game than a film, but we shall come to that. Before we dive into the plot then, let's talk a little bit about the production and background of this film, because this film had a very long journey to get to the big screen. So as I mentioned, this was one of John and or Ron's Muska and or Clements' passion project, dating right the way back to those gong shows of Katzenberg and Eisner's first time at Disney. Neither of them really saw the potential in this project, but after Jeffrey Katzenberg has left, Michael Eisner definitely saw the potential in Musker and Clements. So after three pretty big hits from them, they were finally able to make this project. And I really like the initial pitch of Treasure Island in Space, but the key thing for them was what they called the 70-30 rule, which was every element of this film had to be 70% inspired by the traditional pirate aesthetic and 30% sci-fi and space. So rather than just spaceships, we're looking at space galleons and all of the uniform is very traditional. And I really think they nailed that aesthetic. I think it was a really good idea that they were right to focus so much on throughout the production. It's there in the visuals, it's there in the sound. I really like that 70-30 rule. I have very mixed feelings about it. Generally, I tend to agree. I think the aesthetic is a good decision overall. There's some decisions I question, and we will come to those. And again, Maybe if someone who doesn't care that much for Treasure Island as a story, maybe I'd have liked some further departures from it. There's certainly some choices where I think maybe they had this idea and they stuck to it a bit too rigidly and it doesn't necessarily help the film very much. One thing in particular that I think works quite well, and maybe you'll agree with me here, is that that 70-30 also really applied to the animation because whilst this is traditionally 2D animated. There are lots of 3D models and 3D backgrounds throughout the film, which when we were talking to Tao Nguyen, who worked on this film, he mentioned about how tricky it could be drawing those characters onto the 3D backgrounds. But I think the end result is actually really quite striking. I think it's blended really well, far better than many films at the time were doing. The word I'd use to describe it, Liam, is weird. It doesn't look bad, and I think the two component elements of the 2D and 3D animation are both done well. Certainly the 3D animation for the time, it is pretty gorgeous in places. It's just a weird decision to make. I can't really explain it any other way. I think if you watch clips of this, maybe you'll see what I mean, but 
don't know. It, in some ways, it reminds me of the old 50s and 60s cartoons where you've got these hand-drawn backgrounds and then the bit that's going to move looks totally different because that's animated on top of it. It kind of feels the same way to me. I can definitely see that. One thing that I think was handled very well was some of the more dynamic set pieces. There are a few scenes where we will follow a character running through like some tunnels or some pipes. And the idea was that the directors wanted to be able to do what Spielberg was doing and what all of the live action directors were doing. And you can only do that with a 3D environment. And at times it feels a little bit show offy. But it adds tension to the scene that's supposed to be there, and it's tension that wouldn't be there without that 3D environment and the work of the animators meticulously adding these 2D models to them and understanding how the model would change as the camera and the framing is changing. And I think technically it is a great achievement, particularly for the time. I know in this era of 3D animated movies, it seems quite quaint, but the work that had to go into that, as I say, particularly with the understanding of how the character model would change with the framing of the shot, is incredible. Let's dive into the plot then. We open on a big action set piece detailing the adventures of the notorious space pirate Captain Flint who would raid ships in the night and disappear. And we get this big, violent, dramatic opening that seems to be how Disney wanted to open their films at the time. The difference between this and Atlantis is, whereas Atlantis felt very disjointed in its opening, we are specifically being told a story. And we realise we're actually being told a story along with the young Jim Hawkins, who is reading this story in a book, and the book is holographic. It's incredibly violent for a small child to have, but I like it. I like the idea of it. It's a traditional book. You open it up, and you get holograms telling you the story. One thing that's weird about this, as you say, it's quite weirdly violent for a young child, but I can't imagine many children falling asleep to the voice of Claude Frollo, because this is narrated by Tony Jay, who voices Frollo, and it gives it a very intense feel. Let's not kid ourselves. If Tony Jay was still with us, he'd have one of the most popular ASMR channels on YouTube. Yes, one of the most terrifying ASMR channels on YouTube. <laughs> now, I think generally this film has a really strong cast actually. Basically everyone here is maybe not a full-blown celebrity but certainly a high-profile performer. But I don't think Musker and Clements get the best performances out of some of these. So in this opening sequence, Laurie Metcalf who voices Jim's mum gives some really flat delivery. There's a particular line where she says Oh, can those eyes get any bigger? And there's no energy to it. And again, maybe I'll put it in the edit, but It's just not very good. (laughs) I'd agree with that. And luckily she's not a huge part of the film or really a huge part of Jim Hawkins' major character arc. She's just kind of there to tell the audience the state of Jim Hawkins at the start of the film. And I do think it's done quite well in this opening. We see her energetic and happy when she's dealing with the young Jim Hawkins reading the book. But when we cut forward to young delinquent Jim Hawkins. She's a bit more exasperated, but I think most of that is coming through in the animation rather than the performance. I mean, someone in the production of this film, and this film had a huge production crew. It's over a thousand people, which is insane. Someone definitely went... I mean, when I read Treasure Island, I picture someone very hot for Jim Hawkins' (laughs) mum. And then they went, well, you know, we need to show that time's not been kind to her. And, you know, she's had a difficult life. Well, we'll just put bags under her eyes. Done. Because when we jump forward, that's the only way she's aged in 13 years. It's so strange because whenever I see kind of fan artists drawing real people as Disney princesses, whenever someone has to draw a white brunette as a Disney princess, they're just drawing Jim Hawkins' mum. And I'm like, that character exists and she's not a Disney princess. It's like the most generically Disneyfied character I've seen. But yeah, and then they just add bags. Not even a grey streak in the hair, just bags under the eyes. So we also see that Jim Hawkins has aged and is now a teenager. Into pod racing? Yeah, I mean, I'd say this is maybe the most infamous thing about this film. And it's so rad, Liam. And I'm talking about the solar surfing, which 
it's basically space skateboarding, I guess. There's a part in this opening sequence which I've already praised the ability to do more dynamic action sequences by using 3D environments. This is not the best use of that. I feel this is very almost pandering, I feel. Whenever this sequence starts, I just think, okay, it's this bit again, and they're trying to be cool and trying to be very video gamey, as you mentioned earlier. There's a part, though, where he's trying to beat a gear that is closing in, and I just think it's not worth it, because if he misses it, he's crushed and he's dead. This isn't risking falling off a skateboard and feeling cool when you managed it. This is life and death, and it's just a bit extreme for the start of the film. But he's an extreme guy. He's really <laughs> rad. Okay, so the design of Jim Hawkins, he's got, I'm going to say, the most ridiculous haircut possible. He's got a rat tail, basically. It's one of my most hated hairstyles, but I kind of love it. It feels not even really a time capsule because it wasn't cool at the time. It's never been cool. Now, I don't think this is the best Joseph Gordon-Levitt performance either i think it's fine but i'm gonna put this to you liam so liam you like the story of treasure island is there any version of jim hawkins that's likable or interesting well that's an interesting question because strangely enough as i've grown up i don't find the jim hawkins in the novel particularly interesting he's just a very plucky and fairly lucky young boy in the face of extreme danger and i think you have to do something with that I actually quite like what they did with Jim Hawkins in this film. By making him a little bit older, you can give him at least a character arc, which the original Jim Hawkins doesn't have. He's too young and he's more just a vessel through which the reader experiences the story. I don't feel that is the wrong decision, necessarily. And I agree that making him a teenager slash young man does give way to other things like him killing someone, which will happen later in the film. I don't really get what Jim's character arc is meant to be. I think it's meant to be about his dad, and there's some very heavy-handed stuff later. But watching the opening of this film, I don't really get what his character is about, other than being a moody teenager who's very rad. But that is his character. He is a juvenile delinquent, which, not the most original character, not the most interesting, but It is a character, at least. He's the juvenile delinquent who is one incident away from ruining his life and needs to figure out his direction because he has had no one to offer him that direction. Sadly, the local law enforcement are down with Jim's radness and some cop robots arrest him, but they seem... At first I was like, oh, they're like, just, you know, like, we are the law, we enforce the laws but then they have like personalities and they kind of make some jokes and stuff and i was like oh are these like you know ai i feel that was the first point where i was like i don't think the aesthetic in this film is very consistent obviously it's meant to be a deliberate mashup of classical age of sail and space stuff fine i get that but some of the space stuff is we're gonna do you know your steampunk like everything's quite physical and it's a sort of different version of technology but then you get stuff like this where these robots just look like they're out future armor and they don't gel with the rest of the aesthetic at all what you're saying is it's hard to believe in a universe where there are ai robotic police officers but we still use manual rope lifelines i mean i always get that that that's deliberate But I can't accept that they can program robots with personalities, but then, like, you still have to have a steam-powered leg. I actually get this. I think that whilst I like the concept and, to a degree, the execution of the 70-30 rule, I feel that in many places it should have been every single object is 70% inspired by The Age of Sail and 30% inspired by future sci-fi. Instead of, you can have characters that are completely sci-fi, and then you have characters like Jim's mum, who, there's nothing futuristic or sci-fi about her. You can just rip her out of the story and put her into a traditional adaptation of Treasure Island. On the note of other characters who are at the tavern, I don't see what is sci-fi about a dog person. I just find it weird. So Dr. 
Dingle Dupler, or whatever his name is. <laughs> Voiced wonderfully, I might say, by David Hyde Pierce, who I have nothing but time and affection for. I think they nailed what they were going for, I just don't understand why they were going for that. So Delbert Doppler, family friend of the Ben Bowen, I suppose, and apparently not an appropriate father figure for Jim Hawkins. He's just kind of there. He seems to work as an astronomer in some other part of the planet, but for some strange reason spends a lot of time at this inn. How do you feel about this character, Liam? I understand his purpose. I just wish it were more subtly done. I have stated many times I don't like overtly comedic characters. I think comedy can come from all sources. You don't need a wacky character to provide some relief to the audience. I'm going to say it. I think Dr. Doppler has a 0% hit rate for jokes. And he gets a lot of jokes in this film. And I can see David Hyde Pierce is trying to sell them. At one point, it's him doing like a go Delbert, go Delbert. And I physically cringed. Because, ah, uh, it's just bad. I was watching this film with someone, and when that moment came on, we both cringed and had to pause it, so I'm glad you felt the same way. Though it does make me wonder that that got past the studio, where they watched it and were like, yep, this is funny, people will like this, I enjoy this, therefore other people will enjoy this. Though I actually imagine instead it was a, well, I don't enjoy this, but children will. More than anything, Treasure Planet is one of those films where I think it was made by men in their 50s, and they went, yep, this is cool, yep, this is funny. It's interesting because this is the follow-up to Hercules, and I feel that Hercules had a lot of those same problems where stuff was kind of put in, not because the people making it liked it or understood it, but because they thought it's what the audience wanted to see. And it's very rare that any creative endeavour works out well when it's being done when the person making it is trying to preempt what other people will like rather than it being something they like and that they're passionate about. Obviously, Clements and Musker did have passion for this, but certainly in some of the scripting, it feels like, yeah, there was that second guessing going on. So we've got our protagonist, we've got the supporting cast around him of the Ben Bowen, including a strange little frog girl who just steals food, which is never okay regardless of the period. Disgusting. And right on time, as Jim is downtrodden and looking for adventure, we see a ship crash at the pier containing the dying pilot pirate, Billy Bones, with a small treasure chest and desperately looking for shelter and warning people to beware the cyborg. Now, I watch these films on DVD, and it's at this point I realised the DVD audio for this film is terribly balanced to the point where I had to turn my TV up to about 80, where it's normally around 20. And that's annoying enough, but I also watch these on an Xbox. And I was downloading Conan Exiles in the background, so it was at this point where I got a deafening Xbox bleep <laughs> to tell me that not only had the game installed, but unbeknownst to me, I got a little pop-up saying, free nudity DLC installed, which I don't remember requesting. But that's my main note for this sequence. <laughs> Was that for the game or the DVD that you were watching? Presumably the game? It didn't actually say. It would explain a lot of the nudity in the second <laughs> half of this film, though. <laughs> After Billy Bones takes his dying breath, then, Jim notices that someone is outside and we get the introduction of our silhouetted pirate crew. And I really love the silhouettes here. I think because... The story isn't deviating too far from Treasure Island. I think most people know about the character of Long John Silver and that that is who is involved at this point. I imagine there's going to be someone who this was their first exposure to this story. But for the most part, we know it's Long John Silver and we see him in silhouette and I think it's done really well. It reminds me of the problems I had with Beauty and the Beast, where we see the Beast too fully before we get the reveal of his character alongside Belle. And I think Disney has just got much better at teasing characters before they are revealed. And I think this is a really good example of that. And the action sequence around it is just a really nice action sequence. I think following Atlantis, the animators really know how to put together an exciting action sequence at the moment. 
Speaking of that action sequence then, the pirates raid the tavern, forcing our heroes to escape. The tavern is destroyed in the process, and shortly afterwards at Delbert's study, Jim manages to solve the puzzle of the sphere, and it reveals the apparent location of Treasure Planet, which, according to legend, is where Captain Flint stored his treasure. So Delbert decides that it's going to be a great opportunity for him as an academic and decides to put together a crew and sail out to find it. Bar the aforementioned Go Delbert dance, I think this sequence is really nice. I think the animation on the treasure map is wonderful. And I really like this idea of Flint being this legendary pirate that children know about. And Jim's mum dismisses the map as just those stories. But Delbert immediately jumps onto it and wants to fund the whole expedition. Sees this as an opportunity that maybe a few character building months at space is exactly what Jim needs to turn his life around. And thus we have the start of Jim's arc. One thought... The police officers say Jim solar surfing and smashing things up breaks his probation, but going on a pirate ship halfway across the galaxy, presumably that's fine. That's within the conditions of the probation. That's because being a pirate is nowhere near as rad as solar surfing. They're very strict on radness in this universe, sure. One thing as well that I noticed in this sequence is there is a particular type of joke that Disney... They did a bit in Atlantis... They do a lot in this film, and now that I've noticed it, it's all I'm going to be noticing in the films going forward, which is what the joke is, is a character will be talking, and then visually, they'll be contradicted. And that's the punchline. So in this sequence, it is Delbert talking about the complexity of the treasure map and how it would take experts weeks to unlock it. And just as he's saying that, Jim unlocks it, and that's the joke. And you better find that joke funny because it happens about 10 times in this film. Now, hypothetically, Liam, if I didn't find that joke funny, would that skew my enjoyment of this film? I suppose it is also functional dialogue. It's not a kind of cul-de-sac joke where it draws your attention to it and hopes you find it funny. It just is moving the story forward and hoping you'll have a chuckle along the way. But because it's so persistent, it begins to grate a little bit. Funnily enough... A version of that joke is how we start our next scene with Delbert talking off screen about the suit he's bought and then we see he's in a ridiculous old diving suit. This never serves any purpose as far as I can tell in the plot other than to make Delbert look like an idiot and they get on board their ship, the RLS Legacy, named after Robert Louis Stevenson and presumably something called Legacy. Once again, I really like the aesthetic of the spaceport. I think the transition from the study to the spaceport is really nice where we see that the crescent moon that's been in the background the whole time that is the spaceport and we zoom into it the port is bustling with that 70 30 energy and i think it's one of the sequences that gets it really right where there is this gritty steampunk aesthetic to it as opposed to a mishmash of different elements some of which are sci-fi some of which are traditional i totally agree with that as a comparison point The market scene in Atlantis doesn't really quite pop with that same energy, whereas here I was genuinely like, I want to explore this universe. This place is interesting. We don't spend long here, but yeah, I'd agree. We also get the introduction of our captain, Captain Amelia, who I have to say, I'm really glad they changed this character to being a woman. I think if they hadn't, there are very few women in the original story of Treasure Island, and I think this is a really interesting character that's very unique to the film now if they could have changed her to being a woman without an unnecessary love story would have been even better but hey ho this is one of those i'd say very 90s love stories where you've got a bumbling pathetic male character and a mary sue babe female character she is part cat but I think functionally she's meant to be a babe. That's certainly how Delbert sees her. And inexplicably, she's attracted to him, even though in this universe she can clearly do better. He's literally a dog. (laughs) I think similar to Atlantis, whilst I have a problem with the love story, there is so little done to support it that I can kind of brush over it and then just ignore the conclusion at the end. The disgusting conclusion. Because it's not really there. We also meet the first mate, Mr. Arrow, with the 
absolutely beautiful voice of Roscoe Lee Brown behind him. I really like the characterization of Mr. Arrow given to him through his voice. I also have a voice note here. Oh, we didn't mention Emma Thompson voices Captain Amelia, by the way. That's a pretty big deal. My favourite voice performance of the crew is Scroop, voiced by Michael Wincott, who just has the most amazing voice in the world. I can't see him getting cast as many romantic leads or comedy sidekicks, but his voice is incredibly badass. (laughs) What I love about Scroop is that the writers looked at this film and said, so Long John Silver is the villain, but he's not particularly villainous. How do we make up for that? I know, let's have a incredibly sinister space spider that you take one look at and you're like, yep, that's an evil creature. And then you listen to and you're like, that's an incredibly evil creature. And then he kills someone and you're like, yeah, he's not a good one. So we have our ship, we have our captain, we have our treasure map. We also have a crew that was picked by Delbert. And this is a detail I only picked up on this time. And this is from the original story as well. Like, it's not the captain's original crew, which I find very strange in this kind of story. Like, you'd expect a captain to have their own ship and their own crew, or at the very least, their own company that will supply them with a crew that they all work for but it works because we've got Delbert being a cheapskate and hiring the cheapest crew he could possibly find and they're clearly all pirates. Amelia basically says as much at one point as well saying that she doesn't trust the crew and that they need to keep the purpose of the mission quiet which I think yeah that works until you get to Treasure Planet and then it's like they're definitely going to mutiny I'm going to say this, whilst we're still in port and could change the crew, I don't trust this crew. Anyway, let's set out. (laughs) So since the purpose of the mission is going to be a secret, it would be strange and suspicious to have this young man wandering about the ship equivalent to an officer. So Captain Amelia assigns Jim as a cabin boy to the ship's cook, Long John Silver. In a similar way to how... Iago always overshadows Othello in Othello. Long John Silver very much overshadows Jim Hawkins and basically anything else in most versions of Treasure Island, and I would say that's very much the truth here. I was really worried you were about to say that Iago overshadows Jafar. (laughs) Never. So part of the reason I love the story of Treasure Island is because I think Long John Silver is one of the greatest literary villains. So let's talk about the things I really like about this. So first off, Brian Murray's performance as Long John. It always takes me a little while to get into it because he's going for something I think a little bit different. He's not being trying to be overly charismatic and he's also not trying to be overly gruff. He kind of has this weird middle ground. It actually works really, really well. And I absolutely love the visual design of Long John Silver as a cyborg. He's got this arm that has all these different tools on. It flows beautifully. I think it fits in really well, both in terms of the aesthetics and also the plot, where he's always got got an answer for everything, which obviously fits the character really well. I genuinely forgot how much I like this version of Long John Silver. The visual design in particular is wonderful. I think this is the best example of what they should have been going for with that 70-30 rule, where he's clearly a futuristic cyborg, But those tools that are attached to him, they're old-fashioned blunderbusses and scimitars. And his leg is this steampunk-powered peg leg. It's wonderful. And the voice performance. I know what you're saying, actually. I really like the voice performance, but I have the same problem here that I had with Kida in Atlantis, in that it feels so out of place because they're actually doing a voice performance as opposed to just getting an actor in to voice the character like David Hyde Pierce is just doing David Hyde Pierce's voice and he's just talking very contemporarily Brian Murray's performance is very pirate like and you could put it in a traditional adaptation of Treasure Island but also the script itself I wonder how much of it he brought to it because his dialogue feels very different to everyone else's and even though as a result he stands out. It just makes me wish everyone else was written and performed with the same energy and passion. Another element of 
Silver that has been sci-fied is he no longer has a talking parrot and instead has Morph, which is a shape-shifting little pink blob. I'm going to describe Morph as chaotic neutral in that Morph doesn't seem to have any particular allegiance other than just causing mayhem. And the way the character is presented is that that isn't the case. But if you follow his actions and the fact he just laughs maniacally at everything, he's just a sociopath. I mean, that's a pretty good interpretation of Captain Flint. Captain Flint the bird, not the original captain. Remember how I said that Stitch was one of my three most adorable Disney characters? I'm going to extend that list to four because I always forget about Morph, but Morph is adorable, if terrifying. I don't care for Morph. I'd much prefer if he had the little orange clay man Morph as his sidekick, (laughs) which wouldn't make any sense and would be very confusing, but I prefer that Morph. The switcheroo near the end of the film would be very different as well. (laughs) So Jim's set to work, and once again, he's just a bit rubbish. I mean, I've got a note here that just says Jim sucks. Like, he's asked to mop the deck, and it seems to take him forever. We literally see it go from night to day, and I was like, come on, Jim, how long does it take to mop one deck? He's a rubbish cabin boy. To be fair, Ben, that night to day could have happened very quickly if they were passing a star. You're just forgetting about the setting of this world entirely. I'd go the other way, Liam. I'd say, how does it turn to night? Given they're in space, there's nothing for the sun to hide behind. (laughs) So we've now basically set up the heart of this film, which is that Long John Silver is worried that having Jim about is going to scupper his plans. So he's going to have to keep the boy busy. And on the other hand, Jim is still annoyed that despite finding and bringing the treasure map, he's basically been assigned to intense manual labour, which is only worsened by the fact that Long John is trying to keep him busy. Which leads us into the big montage of the film, which involves Long John working Jim to keep him busy, and Jim eventually meeting and surpassing those expectations, basically earning the respect of Long John Silver. And this is all intercut with images of Jim growing up with his own father and eventually his father leaving. And this is all set to a OK song by John Resnick. Liam, I think you mispronounced awful song. Whenever it comes to music, I definitely do not have the technical know-how to really ever be comfortable saying whether a song is good or bad. And if someone likes a song, then it's a good song. And many people love this song and this sequence. You can go to the YouTube video, it's full of people praising this film and praising this scene in particular. My problem with it is that it is an incredibly saccharine song to me. And the overall theming of this montage is a little bit on the nose. I wish instead we'd had a few more scenes of Long John and Jim rather than we have the initial meeting, a montage, and then they have respect for each other. And I understand that montages are a cinematic device that are a very efficient way of showing a passage of time and a development of a relationship, but they can't be the only way you see that development of the relationship. Liam, you say that you don't feel you have the skills and knowledge to criticise whether a song is good or bad. But if I said to you, we are Siamese from Lady and the Tramp, you feel you can't put any value judgement on that song. I can't say if it is a musically bad song, but I could definitely say that it is a morally reprehensible song. (laughs) I really don't like this sequence. I like what it's trying to do, but it's way too heavy-handed. The thing I've always liked about the relationship between Long John Silver and Jim Hawkins in this story is I feel there's a lot of nuance in them both softening by having a relationship they've not had before, that father-son relationship. But it's just way too heavy-handed. The way it's intercut with these flashbacks of Jim's deadbeat dad, it honestly feels the only way it could have been more explicit if it literally had text on screen saying, John is a father figure to Jim now. <laughs> Yeah, I love the core relationship, I just hate the way it is being developed. As a reference point, Muppet Treasure Island, which is a much sillier film, and also has Kevin Bishop playing Jim Hawkins, who objectively cannot act, I still buy into that relationship more, even though it's a very different, sillier film. There is one element to this relationship in this film that I really like, and that is that the two of them together 
have a theme. Whenever the two of them are sharing a moment, there is a particular musical motif that they will use, and it's only ever used when the two of them are together. They both individually have themes and motifs, but they also together have one, and it is one of the prettiest pieces of music in the film, in my opinion. I generally like the score of this film, actually. I don't like the actual song, which is very early naughty sort of country pop, but the actual orchestral score I do think is very strong and works well with the film. I'd have to give it that. It's funny, isn't it, that similar with Atlantis, they said that they didn't think this would be appropriate as a musical, so they instead wanted to be a more traditional narrative, but they still wanted that montage, so they had to do the Tarzan thing. But as you mentioned, there is a really solid musical adaptation of Treasure Island, and it's Muppet's Treasure Island. (laughs) To be fair, Liam, Muppet Treasure Island was done by freaking Hans Zimmer, which is (laughs) nuts. (laughs) And for the actual singing, they had Tim Curry, which you're never going to beat. I think it speaks volumes that I like both of these versions of Long John Silver, because I think they're trying to do different things. We've got this burgeoning relationship of, as you say, the two of them softening each other, which is wonderful if done fairly inelegantly and a bit heavy-handed. Ironic for a man with a robot hand. (laughs) Sorry. But Silver's crew, particularly Scroop, notices this and point out that they think that Silver is going soft. So he kind of doubles down, convinces them all that he's still in charge, everything's still going to plan. But the crew are unsettled and are cautious of Jim and his effect on their captain, Long John Silver. Which leads very nicely into our next big action set piece where the ship is passing a star that dies and immediately goes supernova. Now, scientifically, I'm not sure exactly how this works, but I think they put a lot of care into creating an appropriate set piece from it, and it feels really quite exciting. Yeah, we've not touched on this massively, because the ship they have is, it's a wooden deck flying through space, right? And it's got these sails that they call solar sails so the idea i think is they absorb solar energy and that powers the engines which is quite elegant we don't quite get a full explanation of you know how things work on the ship but there's some artificial gravity and that's kind of got a certain radius around it so i kind of assume the ship exudes some sort of atmosphere to protect them from space radiation that said even with all that in mind i feel every character would die during the sequence because (laughs) They basically fall into a black hole at one point. A supernova effectively explodes in their face. I just feel they'd all be dead. But luckily, every character doesn't die. Not every character lives, but not every character dies. Because whilst the crew are securing the sails, Jim is tasked with securing the lifelines. And we have this nice little action sequence where between Doppler and Amelia, they come up with a plan to ride the next wave sending them to freedom. This causes a big jolt, at which point Mr. Arrow is knocked overboard, but luckily his lifeline is secured. But, oh no, Scroop comes along and cuts the lifeline. Again, I feel if he's that far away from the ship, next to a black hole, I don't know how a piece of rope would have saved him anyway. I've just had a theory about Scroop. This wasn't in my notes. I think he's dedicated his life to becoming a badass because his name is Scroop. Because... If you weren't picturing this character and I said, draw Scroop, you would draw a bumbling idiot. (laughs) He sounds like the sidekick in a pantomime. So I think that's what led to his murderous tendencies. He's the complete antithesis of Shmi. Who's just embraced having a bumbling sidekick name. (laughs) They're brothers that went in very, very different directions. One becoming a giant crab monster in space. (laughs) What? (laughs) I really like the fallout of this event where Jim is blamed because the lifeline apparently was not secure. Scroop has untied the other end of that lifeline and he now feels responsible for Mr. Arrow's death. Also, Amelia believes he's responsible for Mr. Arrow's death. But the most interesting reaction is from Silver, who can immediately see through what has happened, but can't comfort Jim because doing so would reveal his plot and the nature of his crew. I really like this change, because in the original book, Mr. Arrow just falls overboard because I think Silver gives him some alcohol, and then on a stormy night, drunk Mr. Arrow falls overboard. They do it slightly better in 
Muppets Treasure Island, I think Sam is just knocked overboard at one point. I can't quite remember, but this is probably my... They trick him into testing the lifeboat, so he just rows to Treasure Island. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, that's actually very funny. But from a narrative perspective, I think this is one of the most wonderful changes in this story. And it's so minor, but it has such a profound impact on Jim and the characters around him. I think it's wonderful. This is a good example of don't worry about it happened off screen because Scrooge managed to untie the knot Jim had fairly securely put at the base of the mast using claws. (laughs) It's very hard to untie things using claws. It's very easy to cut them though. Yeah, I suppose that's fair. But I suppose he did run to the lifelines, cut it and throw the rope overboard before anyone noticed. But he's a very quick little spider scorpion crab monster in the aftermath of the black hole then jim is despondent he's at a very low point silver can't comfort him and at one point morph in as you say true chaotic neutral fashion leads jim to the ship's kitchen and very conveniently into a very large barrel of space plums yep space plums where he gets front row seats to a meeting between Silver and his crew, where Jim realises what is going on. The crew conveniently confront Silver about his relationship to Jim, to which Silver doubles down and says he's just using the boy and keeping him close so he doesn't cause any trouble for them. Not a nice thing to overhear from your now adoptive father figure. The crew go back to business having been convinced that now is not the time to mutiny and the plan is still going as is and as Jim is emerging Silver realizes that he heard all of that and we have a confrontation between the two in which Jim stabs Silver's leg again wonderfully animated wonderfully realized in the character conception of Silver but also we have that dynamic camera and just the incredible work of the animators understanding how to frame the characters as the camera patterns. Jim rushes to warn Amelia that the crew are all pirates and are going to mutiny. Silver decides he can't waste any more time and they execute the mutiny, effectively taking over the ship. So our heroes have to escape on one of the lifeboats during which Delbert manages to kill several people. (laughs) But it's quite lighthearted, so don't worry. They flee to the surface of Treasure Planet. But not before Silver has his very own point break moment, which I really enjoy every time it happens. Just to clarify, you mean he could shoot Jim, but chooses not to. Not he goes surfboarding. Or puts on a Richard Nixon mask. Both fine options. We've got Jim, Doppler and Amelia heading to Treasure Planet with the treasure map, only to realise that the map they have is in fact Morph and the true map is back on the ship. But their priority now is just to survive and avoid the pirates as best as they can. Ben, I think it's time to talk about Ben. I mean, where do we start? I was born in 1988. (laughs) So if you'd had enough of Delbert, the wacky comedy sidekick, we are now introduced to a second wacky comedy sidekick. Ben, the robot voiced by Martin Short. Ben seems to have a lot more CGI going on with him. And again, I find it personally quite jarring when he's sort of on the same plane of existence as 2D animated characters. The whole gimmick with Ben is that he's literally lost his mind, his memory core has been taken out, and so that he doesn't remember stuff. But I don't know if that's really what's happening here, because his personality doesn't really seem to change much when he gets it back. I just feel like he's been programmed to be annoying... I love the concept that they went for with Ben. I think the idea of a, I think it's a bioelectrical navigation unit, and he is basically Flint's navigation robot. And to take the character of Ben Gunn, the marooned member of the crew who has deteriorated from his time alone, and transition that into this character, as you say, literally having lost his mind from the removed memory chip. I think the idea is wonderful. The execution of having it be the most annoying character Disney have done so far, voiced by Martin Short, it's too much. This is one of the worst 
attempts to fill that genie-shaped hole from Disney. I'd go so far as to say you could cut this character entirely from the film and it'd be fine. Because the payoff to Ben is that when they find Treasure Planet and find the remains of Flint who's holding the memory core, Ben says, oh yeah, there was a booby trap after the booby trap has already been triggered. So there's no payoff to that. And also it makes no sense that Flint has set this elaborate booby trap made his robot aware, and then rather than just destroying the robot, which seems pretty in keeping with his personality, he's like, I'll take the memory core out and just hold on to that. <sighs> I still want the character. I I just want a different version. I'm just very disappointed as well, because I think Martin Shaw is a fantastic comedic actor, but asking him to dial it all the way up constantly for the performance, again, it reeks of that 50-year-old man making something for an audience they don't understand and they think kids like annoying characters. <laughs> I think they think kids like funny characters and these are funny. They don't think we're going to do something deliberately annoying. <laughs> if they were thinking that, they've succeeded. Whereas I can totally envision a draft of this film which has Martin Shaw voicing a broken robot that isn't irritating and turned all the way up. You can tone down that wackiness and it's still a useful character, but the way they've done it, it just doesn't really fit and I don't like it. As a comparison point, look at Dory in Finding Nemo, who functionally is a very similar character. They've got knowledge of the environment that the protagonist doesn't have and there's a lot of jokes around their memory and the effect that has on their personality. And Dory's one of the most well-loved Pixar characters. And again, voiced by a high-profile American comedian. So again, I don't think the idea is intrinsically broken, but it's not well done. So the rest of this film then is basically just a standoff between the pirates who think that Jim has the map and Jim who knows that he needs to get back to the ship to get the map without letting the pirates know that he doesn't have it. And we get a nice sequence where Jim and for some reason Ben have to sneak back on board the ship. Oh, I suppose it's because Amelia has been wounded and Delbert has to look after her. But I really feel that Ben is more of a hindrance than anything else. Oh no, I've just remembered a joke that I despise in this film. I know what joke it's going to be because I was going to comment on it. Go on. We're very much in a post-Shrek era, which means alongside the contradictory visual gag that I mentioned earlier, the other easy joke to go for is you just reference something and that's a joke. And obviously this went over my head as a kid, but every time I watch it as an adult, it infuriates me that when Delbert is looking after Amelia, he gets to say, damn it, Jim, I'm an astronomer, not a doctor. Well, no, I am a doctor, but not that kind of doctor. Now, I don't know how old Star Trek was when this film came out, but I'm going to say around the 35 year mark. So this isn't a contemporary reference. This is something that's been parodied thousands of times prior to this point. And as you say, it's not even a spin on it. It's just quoting the line. It's not even a joke for the parents because Trekkies don't have children. <laughs> so what we can say is this joke fails because of Trek and Shrek. <laughs> I think there's a few examples of that type of joke in this film, but that is the one that really put a bee in my bonnet. As I was saying then, we've got this sequence where Jim and Ben have to sneak back on board the ship to get the real treasure map. And now we have our climactic confrontation between Jim and Scroop, which I feel could be cut. I don't think the film needs such a villainous character that Jim has to overcome. It feels it's just in there because your film needs a villain, and it doesn't. You can have a nuanced relationship like Jim and Silver without this ridiculous caricature of Scroop. But Jim gets a chance to basically kill him. I don't think the artificial gravity works properly because as soon as the gravity is turned off, they just start floating upwards. Whereas if the gravity was turned off, they'd just float where they are. You say he gets an opportunity to kill Scroop, implying that he shows any mercy. He gets an opportunity to kill Scroop and kills him. <laughs> I think this is the second point where I was like, Lilo and Stitch does this a lot better. Obviously not this sort of thing in terms of an action sequence, but we said in Lilo and Stitch one of the things we liked about it is there's lots of characters who kind of serve a villain role, but they're not just obvious villains, and it would be very easy just to have Stitch kill the big bad guy at the end, but that's not how the film plays out. 
and it works so much better. And the other thing Lilo and Stitch does really well is it does the nuance of there's a parent or parents missing and trying to find a surrogate parent figure without beating you over the head with it. I guess what I'm trying to say is Lilo and Stitch is a better film. (laughs) That's fair. And with Scroop mercilessly cast off into space, echoing what he did to Mr. Arrow, Jim can now return to the surface with the map, return to Doppler and Amelia, and when doing so, realises that they have been captured by the pirates and Silver is just going to take the map. There's a really nice little moment where Jim hands the map over, but because of the technical nature of it, no one else can figure it out. Somehow Jim has figured it out, but no one else can figure it out, so Silver realises that he needs Jim, they make a bargain, and they go in search of the treasure hoard. I think we have a really nice visual sequence here where they're in a small skimmer flying across the planet's surface. The pirates have taken the prisoners with them. They're following not just the treasure map, but like a very tangible line that is leading them to the treasure. And I think visually it works really well. It's a really nice little sequence, eventually culminating in just a dead end. Jim, again, being the smart young man he is, works out that you have to put the sphere in the sphere-shaped hole, very Legend of Zelda, and opens up this portal. I think this is probably my favourite aspect of this world that's been created, because it's this portal that you basically press anywhere on the map that opens a portal to there, which gives an explanation as to why Flint was so able to shoot in and out on his raids, and while no one ever found him. And yeah, I think it's a clever idea, It is used well in the narrative of the film, and it looks great. Yeah, I really like this sequence. And Jim realises the solution is to choose the planet they're on, and voila, it opens up a portal to the centre of the planet, where there's a weird, floaty sphere of gold. And so we're at the climax of our film. We've found the treasure at the heart of Treasure Planet. Everyone enters the treasure hall, I suppose, and we see very clearly there is a laser that is broken by people moving in. Given Captain Flint has an interdimensional portal which no one else has seen the like of, his security measure is basically a (laughs) tripwire. The technology scale... Maybe he spent all the money on the rest of the stuff, and that's all we have left. Well, what I really enjoy is... So, jumping ahead a little bit, we mentioned that we see Flint's ship, and we see Flint, who was elected to just sit on his throne and die in the centre of the planet. I like it. It's kind of an obsessive, I'm going to die with my treasure and make sure no one else can have it. But what he does is he takes Ben, and in order to secure the planet, he needs someone to close the gate, presumably Ben. So he rips Ben's memory core out and sends him outside so that he can't warn people that there's a booby trap. But if Ben doesn't know there's a booby trap, wouldn't Ben have triggered the booby trap, leaving... I mean, I can only assume there was a first and then a second booby trap. So the second booby trap is the one that gets triggered and destroys the planet. And the first was meant to destroy Ben, but he somehow lucked his way out of it. I just like the image of Flint ripping out Ben's memory core, sending him on his way. And as this irritating, idiotic robot leaves, Flint's watching because he's still alive at this point and he just sets the tripwire off and the whole planet blows up. (laughs) Presumably Ben also yeeted the map into space, which is how someone found it. (laughs) So they do trigger this booby trap and all the treasure starts collapsing. It seems like John Silver, for someone who said he had a lifetime obsession with finding this, didn't actually bring any way of transporting any treasure, not even a bucket, which was stupid. So all the treasure starts getting destroyed and in the process... Silver is given the opportunity to save a big chunk of it or to save Jim. And of course, after a lot of difficult thinking, he knows that saving Jim is the right thing to do. Personally, given the planet's about to go and it all looks like they're going to die anyway, I'd be like, well, we're going to die anyway, so I may as well take a punt on the treasure. But that's just me. Plus, you can buy a new Jim with treasure. Buy a lot of Jims. A lot of teenage delinquents out there. Probably with better haircuts. We haven't really touched on this, but this is the big change to Silver that I really like in this adaptation, which is by making Flint a legendary pirate, you can no longer have 
silver B Flint's old first mate. You have to do something else. And what they do is they have Flint basically be Jim. He's someone who grew up on the stories, was probably a delinquent himself. It led him to a life of piracy. He spent his whole life searching for Treasure Planet. We get these moments throughout the film where he talks about his dream. He's talking about how he lost his leg and he says that you give a few things up chasing a dream. And when he first gets to the core of Treasure Planet, the first thing he does is he just kneels down in it, holds the treasure and says, after a lifetime of searching, I can finally touch it. This has been his obsession. And we get that last moment where he has to choose between the treasure and Jim. Obviously, he chooses Jim. That's narratively how this works. But I love this idea of him basically being Jim, someone who has spent his life searching for something. But for him, without the guidance... The something was Treasure Planet. It's a great moment, and I don't think I have a problem with any of Silver's character arc. I think it is well-paced, and it's very well-performed. The problem is, ostensibly, Jim is our main character, and he doesn't really get that character arc. He certainly doesn't get that moment where we can see he's grown and he's changed, particularly. It's just that he's found an environment where what he does is of use to people, which I don't think is the same as character growth. So, yeah, I think it's a great moment for Silver, and it's a perfectly adequate moment for Jim. I'm actually going to disagree. So, jumping ahead a little bit, the conclusion of this film is basically that they need to escape the planet falling apart. There's not going to be enough time to escape beyond the radius of damage. Jim realises that they can just use the portal to go back to the spaceport. And we're going to have to use the power of rad solar surfing. I like... No, I was about to say that I like that Jim has this almost self-sacrifice moment, but that's never really been part of his character, being selfish. I feel that you could have had another character, maybe even Silver, actually sacrifice themselves for this, rather than just giving Jim a moment of heroism. But I like the action set piece. I think it's okay and it gets them back to the spaceport but then we have the real conclusion of the film which is the pirates are all going to be turned over to the authorities and jim catches silver and morph attempting to steal one of the lifeboats and silver appeals to jim he says that little morph is a free spirit he can't face a life in a cage and it would be best if they could just let morph go obviously talking about himself here he appeals to jim And he offers him the chance, he says, leave with me, just you and me, we'll do whatever we want and no one will be able to stop us. And this is where we see the conclusion of Jim's character arc, because what Jim has been working towards is having a direction in life. And it's not just having a father figure. Despite what the awkward montage would have you believe, his character arc is about direction and purpose. And he says that when he first got on this ship, he would have taken that offer up in a heartbeat. But it's instead about finding his own way and following his own path, rather than just trying to become the next Long John Silver. And that's really the conclusion of his character arc to me, is him realising that he's been aimless for so long, and he doesn't necessarily know what it's going to be that he's going to do, but he's going to make a point to find out what that is. He probably also isn't thinking that in letting Long John Silver go, he's going to have to have a very awkward conversation with Arrow's family at the funeral. Yeah, the guy who was responsible for this, I did sort of let go. But the guy who is directly responsible, I also let go into space. (laughs) It would be great if when Silver's going, ah, Morph's a free spirit, he he wouldn't like life behind bars. And Jim's like, that's cool, he's not the one who did all the crimes. (laughs) So It's like the moment in The Rescuers with Penny talking about her teddy, except it doesn't really work when it's a grown adult trying to hide behind a small animal. One thing I find very sad, though, is that Silver goes off on his own. He leaves Morph with Jim. And there's just something quite sad about the image of Silver completely without his crew, now softened from his time with Jim, and he doesn't have his companion with him. He's just completely alone in the universe. He doesn't have his crew because he let them all get killed and captured. Let's not sugarcoat it here. He's not tried to free them as well. He's like, well, I'm going to slip out before I get into trouble. He does, however, give Jim a handful of treasure and says, you can rebuild that in We Burned Down. 
Basically what he's saying is, hey, take this. You can open another inn and you and your mum can go back to your previous shitty life. (laughs) But luckily Jim doesn't do that. He instead uses the money to go to Captain Cadet School. And I guess the mum uses the insurance money to rebuild the inn. He decides to go his own way by joining the military. (laughs) Hey, the important thing is that he chose his own direction. I'm not necessarily supporting the direction he chose but it's still the correct conclusion for his arc we also see that delva and amelia have properly hooked up and had disgusting dog cat human baby hybrids and i hate everything about it no they haven't they follow the lady and the tramp rules which is that boys look like the dad and girls look like the mum but they're dogs and cats and humans it's all of that's wrong (laughs) yeah the ending's a bit of a weird mixed bag we see the various characters back at the recently rebuilt bembo inn we've got the horrifying cat and dog human hybrid children babies we also see ben doing a robot dance which is as irritating as everything else ben does i genuinely forgotten ben came back with them i assumed he died on the planet (laughs) (laughs) well if you just cut those two seconds out of the film you can continue to pretend that and i think that's fine Meanwhile, as Jim is watching all this, he looks out into the stars and sees Mufasa appear in the clouds above him. Wait a second. (laughs) No, what we really get is the stars literally align and project the image of Long John Silver, which I think is cheesy as all hell. What makes it doubly cheesy is that the song playing over this is called Always Know Where You Are and is basically just talking about how you'll always be thinking of someone, regardless of where they are. So, yeah, it's kind of just trying to really hammer home that Jim and Silver have met like ships in the night, departed ways, but they've been forever changed as a result. And it's saccharine, it's on the nose, but I like the characters, so I'll allow it. So that is the story of Treasure Planet, but before Liam and I decide whether we think it's worthy of going on our own refined list of Wally Gisnep's animated classics, our hand-picked creme de la creme selections of all the Walt Disney animated classics fine-tuned into the absolute best, Liam, is there anything else we need to talk about regarding this film? There is just one thing, we need to decide which character we think is the sexiest character in all of Treasure Planet. Now, as always, we're referring to any character that we feel is unnecessarily or inappropriately sexualized. I feel we're very much out of the era of that happening in Disney. Now, it's clearly not Delbert, but beyond that, I've got to admit, I'm not too sure. So Ben, who do you think is the sexiest character in Treasure Planet? I basically write off all the non-human characters in this film because I find them weird and creepy. So I'm going to go with what clearly one of the animators went with and I'm going to say Jim Hawkins is mum. So by ruling out all of the non-human characters, we're just stuck to Jim and his mum then. Which of the non-human characters do you think is a contender? I think Amelia's pretty sexy. It's a sexy girl boss cat woman thing. Yeah, you sound really sold on that. <laughs> I think Mr. Arrow's pretty sexy, but I just love a big, muscly rock man. You see, I think with both of those, you're leaning towards the voice and the actor behind the voice, rather than the character. I also think Silver deserves a mention for being a perfect representation of a really particular branch of masculinity. Granted, he's not human, he's on top of being a cyborg, he's also strangely, almost cat-like himself, he's got Slightly pointed ears, I believe, and little tiny claw fingernails and this bulbous nose. But he's just this big, brute, fatherly figure. And that's sexy. People love the dad bod. I just feel you're wrong on this one. (laughs) I think I've probably got to agree then and say it's really only Jim's mum. She's not in it very much, but she ages very well. In only 10 years, her only change being some small bags under her eyes. That's incredibly impressive. And I don't find juvenile delinquents particularly sexy, particularly not ones with a rat tail. So Jim's completely out of the question. So yeah, I guess it's Jim's mum. Luckily, she's not particularly sexualized outside of those very classic Disney features on her face. But that's basically it. 
So well done, Disney, for not inappropriately sexualizing all of your women. I mean, one's a mum and one's a love interest, and those are the only two female characters. So you do lose some points there. Hey, I'm not saying it's passing the Bechdel test, but it's a damn sight bore than some of their other films. Which leaves just one question to answer, and that's whether we think this film is worthy of being called a Wally Gisnep animated classic. Luckily, I've got the treasure sphere here, ready to go, as I twist it and its lights fly everywhere. A beam shoots about three feet ahead of me to the giant vault. Not sure why I needed the map here, but it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I open the vault and retrieve our exclusive list of Wally Gisnep's animated classics. Now, Ben, as I've said, I love Treasure Island. I love Space Pirates. And I think that this version of the relationship between Jim and Silver conceptually might be my favourite. Is there a but coming here, Liam? There's not a but. There is, though, a however. (laughs) (laughs) Because despite all of that... In execution, I just find this film to be a little lacklustre. I love the pitch of the 70-30 split and where there are moments where they nail the melding of the two visuals with Silver and the spaceport and the ship itself, I think, is a perfect blend of that. There are other elements where it just feels some from column A and some from column B. I think the score, they nailed it with throughout. I think the score is beautiful. The animation is beautiful. It all just comes down to quite poor writing. And I think a film with such poor writing and such really ill-fitting humour, I can't put such a film on this list. As someone who doesn't really like the story of Treasure Island and is fairly indifferent to space pirates, I was surprised by how much I got out of this rewatch. I went in thinking this is a duffer, basically. And whilst it hasn't entirely convinced me that it's a masterpiece, far from it, I did get more out of this. The comic relief does not work at all. I don't care for Jim Hawkins. I think the aesthetic is mixed. I think the emotional beats start well and then just become mawkish and heavy-handed. I think it looks gorgeous. Genuinely, I do. And as I say, there's some moments like the spaceport and the portal where I was like, I want to dive into this world. But that's how I feel throughout all of Atlantis. There's not moments where I feel that way. I feel that way throughout. If you want the best adventure film in the Disney canon, it's Atlantis. If you want the best Disney film about coping with that parental absence, it's Lilo and Stitch. Or basically most Disney films, to be honest, because a lot of them are missing their parents. But it's definitely not Treasure Planet. There's some good stuff in here. It's just... None of it gels properly, it's just a bit of a mess, and there's more bad than good in this film, so for me it's also a no. I do want to add though that whilst it might not be a classic, if you've not seen this film, which a lot of people haven't, I think it's worth a watch and there is stuff here. I will say that this is probably the worst Disney film that I still inexplicably love. I just know it's not a very good film, but I enjoy watching it. I just have to look past the massive flaws and with that treasure planet has failed to make the list of wally gisnep's animated classics so we put the scroll untouched back into the vault set the booby trap and hope our robotic friend doesn't set it off on his way out now i don't think that booby trap is in danger of going off anytime soon because i'm very conscious of what the next few years of disney is bringing us (laughs) speaking of which ben What film is up for consideration next time? Next week, Liam, we are looking at 2003's Brother Bear, probably one of the more interesting entries of the next few years, and certainly the one that I feel the most conflicted about. So I'm really looking forward to revisiting this film. Before we finish up, just want to say thank you very much for listening. This has been Wally Gisnep's Animated Classics, which is available on SoundCloud, Spotify, a number of other podcast hosting platforms, and a special enhanced version on YouTube which is also where you can find various stupid edits we do of Disney films, interviews, and a bunch of other content for Disney fans. As always, we massively appreciate you liking and subscribing and commenting. Only do the latter if it's going to be nice, though. 
And with that, remember to watch Brother Bear and join us next time for Wally Giznap's animated classics. You don't have to wear a suit.